Good afternoon. Let's get started. Um, I'm really excited about this session. I, um, I'm not going to recite everybody's resume because they're very long. These are some really terrific uh, surgeons and uh, neuroscientists that we have in the room today to talk about brain-based visual impairments. I did want to introduce Dr. Linda Lawrence, who is on our scientific advisory board. Uh, she joined, well, she we met because I emailed the American Academy of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus so Society and said that children with hemianopia are getting really poorly served in school and we're having these issues, and, and that was it. So we hooked Dr. Lawrence very quickly, and she helped me write a guide on uh, vision after surgeries which remove the occipital lobe. She introduced me to Dr. Schwartz, who now both of them do whatever I ask them to do. So they, they like to laugh. <laughs> I just say, we need this, and we get it, which includes introductions to um, professional organizations like APOS or the Perkins School for the Blind, who invite us to come out to talk, the American the Association for the Education and Rehabilitation of the Blind and Visually Impaired. And we're now part of their neurological vision impairment group. So now all TVIs in the countries know about kids who've had an occipital lobe removed. So thank you, Dr. Lawrence. Dr. Berman, thank you for reaching, responding to my email after your big paper was on CNN, I think. And, and right, so uh, thanks. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much, and I feel really honored to be a part of this group. I can tell you I have learned so much myself and a lot from the parents, and I really appreciate that. I tend to be, I'm in a, from a small town in Kansas, so um, yeah, um, I used to say the middle of nowhere, but now I say the middle of everywhere because we're right in the middle of the geographic um, USA. And um, I started working with early intervention about 30 years ago as an ophthalmologist. I'm a comprehensive ophthalmologist. Am I okay? So um, I work with adults also, so I work throughout the lifespan. And my areas of interest are mainly in the um, autism, persons with autism spectrum and um, neurodevelopmental disabilities. So, um, so this is like a lot of new learning for me because where I am, I think I have maybe seven or eight patients, mostly they find me through Monica, and they come. <laughs> so um, I've really, really enjoyed being a part, of, a part of all this. And we're learning with you. This is not something that um, physicians um, are taught in medical school. We don't learn this in our ophthalmology training. Um, we learn surgery and, and diseases and acute care, but we don't learn rehabilitation. So people like Terry and myself have do this. She's done a lot of work in uh, Cincinnati and also West Virginia and also internationally like I have. We do it because of our interest, and then the experience grows, and there's just a handful of ophthalmologists who do this, so we get to know each other. And if you have special needs, you know, for either your children or you have ideas, feel free to contact either one of us. And we have another network of folks, you know, nationally and internationally that we're happy to, to, to work with you all. So we're going to start. I'm going to present a little more generalized um, overview of vision and uh, brain-based visual impairment. And I do want to remind you that on the website, this is available to you to download if you haven't seen it. Um, we need to continue to update it. Monica and I put this together a couple years ago, so obviously there's some new things, and appreciate any comments you have about the um, book. You can share that with your er intervention teams, and also the vision evaluations after epilepsy surgery is on the website, so feel free to use that. It's, it's a great resource. So Terry and I were talking about, you know, what are we going to talk about, and, and I said, you know, it's really hard because basically every person that we're talking about is a unique human being. So we decided we should have a separate ICD code called 2C for you. And it's kind of a joke, but it's really like, you know, we, our kids, our families, we can't fit everybody into a box. So sometimes if you ask us a question about, well, my child had this, therefore, what should they look like? We're not going to be able to really give you an answer without doing a proper assessment. You know, the medical records, what happened, the surgery, the MRIs, the underlying diagnosis help guide us, but none of that defines your child. 
So remember, your child is not a diagnosis. They're not an ICD code. They're not a surgical procedure. They're a human being that's absolutely unique and guided by a lot of different things. For example, what causes seizure disorder in the first place? You know, there's different reasons. There can be an isolated lesion. There can be a more generalized lesion that's going to cause additional problems with the visual, uh, visual system even before you've had the surgery done. So that's a part of it. There's other comorbidities. There's like um, uh, hearing, health, general health, cognition, physical abilities, environmental abilities, medications that are used, what type of resection was performed. Is the, there a visual impairment that's also ocular-based? Does that go along with the underlying etiology of the seizure? Is there an ocular impairment, and how do we measure it? So we're going to go through those briefly. So for example, what causes seizure disorder? Um, you know, some of the genetic syndromes are absolutely can cause problems in the retina and optic nerve and other parts of the eye. Um, depending on if it was trauma, stroke, or infection, different parts of the brain and visual system are going to be affected. A tumor absolutely depends on the location of a tumor. And we talked about the genetic, but also epileptic seizures can lead to some problems with brain damage, further brain damage, and damage to the visual system. And there's other comorbidities, for example, um, cerebral palsy or other motor delays. That can absolutely affect the use of vision. Okay, so just because you have cerebral palsy doesn't mean you have this, but you're at high risk for not only ocular problems, brain-based problems, but also just using your vision because of your posture. You know, if a child can't use their glasses because their head's hitting a wheelchair and their glasses are like this, guess what? They're not going to be able to see well. Cognitive abilities, of course, and we talked about auditory processing a lot yesterday and the really close relationships of auditory processing, vision, visual processing. Again, there might be other diagnoses like autism spectrum disorder and mental health challenges. Interesting thing about some of these um, mental health challenges is when we look at our cohort of children with brain-based visual impairment, we are finding more and more that some of these kids are being mislabeled because no one's looking at the vision. So yeah, they may have behaviors that look like autism, but if the visual impairment isn't addressed, guess what? They might look like autism. You know, there may be a side glance. They may look at the top of your head because guess what? They can't see your face. They have facial agnosia. So it's really important that somebody who knows vision assesses each child. Medications, I, I always harp on the medications, and one of my big ones is Vigabatran or Sabril. How many of your kids have been on that? How many of you were told that that can cause blindness? Well, that's good, because a lot of mine aren't. And the parents have not a clue that their child is on this medication that can, causes known retinal and optic nerve toxicity almost 100%. Now, if that's your only choice, I mean, that's a tough choice to make, seizure or blindness. But I think the parents need to have a very much informed consent on that and make that choice. So remember, you know, Vigabatran is, is a, a tough medicine. And um, we even stopped, we used to recommend every three months EEGs or, or ERGs, sorry, ERGs and vision exams so we could look and see if there was toxicity. Well, guess what? The toxicity doesn't stop. Plus, what were we going to do? Say stop the medicine? So we quit even recommending routine checkups because that has to be a decision between the family and the, the ep epilepsy specialist or the neurologist and get them off the medicine as soon as they can. But, I mean, it's a tough, tough choice. Topamax is another very interesting seizure medication, topiramate. It's used commonly now for migraines in adults, and it causes um, myopia, very nearsightedness. It's an idiosyncratic reaction. Happens they go from being okay to like they're blind. Uh, it's reversible, and they get angle closure glaucoma. <clears throat> so there can be a lot of pain. I haven't seen it reported in children, but if you have an older child who's on this, you might just keep that in the back of, their, of your mind that if they get a red painful eye, you or two, or can't see that, have them checked out, because this is very much reversible. Um, the new one, Epidiolex, we don't really know, 
Um, somnolence is a, is a big part of the side effects of that medication, so it's not affecting the eyeball, but it's going to affect that, that child's use of vision, as are a lot of the other seizure medications. You know, if your child's sleepy and we're trying to assess them or they're at school, they're not going to perform visually as well as they should be able to. Um, Cuvosa or Robinol, do any of your kids use that? It's pretty commonly used in Europe, and I noticed that the last... Um, uh, conference for cerebral palsy, they had a booth. It's Cuvosa is an anticholinergic medication that's used for drooling. So it's used commonly in the in the population of children with cerebral palsy. It can affect accommodation of the eye, so it can ha make the child have difficulty with focusing. And we can treat that if they need the medicine. We can use glasses, bifocal glasses. So it's just again thinking about it and recognizing it um, that there could be a. a a side effect. So the other thing that's going to affect vision, of course, is what kind of resection, what kind of procedure did your child have, and what parts of the brain um, were affected by the surgery, um, what kind of plasticity there is, and I think Marlene's going to talk probably a lot more about that. Um, but it's going to vary. So again, your child's not going to fit into necessarily, if you go back to the book that, that's online, your child might not fit exactly into one of those categories. So one of the big questions we have to deal with a lot is this is ocular impairment, which we know how to treat a lot, or is it cerebral visual impairment, which we don't know very much how to treat. Um, and I like this picture. This is from um, Dr. Gordon Dutton because it shows at the front the pencil. So this is where ocular would be important. Then you have to have the right picture. You have to have the right distance. You have to have the right refraction. You have to have the right eyeball, the peripheral sensory organ, to take that picture, bring it back here to the lateral geniculate body. And this we usually call anterior visual problems if it's in front here, even though we know this part, the optic nerve, is actually part of the brain. And then it goes back into the occipital lobes and into the temporal and parietal lobes and then to the uh, frontal lobe for executive function. Anywhere along that path can cause visual impairment. Anywhere. So part of our job is trying to figure out, okay, why aren't they seeing like we would expect, and what can we do about it? Can we treat it? Do we habilitate or rehabilitate? So that's, that's kind of the tough question to ask. And ocular or cerebral visual impairment, it's, it's, sometimes it's a little hard to, to differentiate, and people do not understand CVI or cerebral visual impairment. There's an extremely high rate of glasses need in people with any kind of neurological developmental disability, um, well over 50%. I, I work in a large center in Peru where we have children with autism, all sorts of genetic brain disorders, um, Down syndrome, and we have 87% in glasses, um, or they have other visual needs. Often kids with neurodevelopmental problems have uh, poor accommodation, they can't focus up close. And you know what? Ophthalmologists don't typically measure that. So, you know, you have to say, is my child focusing up close? It's easy to test, um, but it's, and there's a special test, and we all have the equipment, but it's just one of those things, you know, we, we're always checking the distance vision, right? You know, what's their distance vision? 20 20. Well, are they driving at night? Do they need 20 20? It does, no, what, are they, what do they see at near to read? What do they see in the classroom? Later on, if they're driving, we can worry about the, if they can see 20 20 at distance. Um, some of the other conditions we'll see is strabismus, which is eye turning in or out, nystagmus, which is eye movement, and that can, um, um, that's neurological, and that can be from a variety of reasons, in, including if there's blindness in the eye, there's another special type of nystagmus or eye movement then a, that can occur. And then again, the ocular disease could be associated what, with what might be causing the seizure disorder, for example, tuber sclerosis, um, where you can actually have lesions in the retina that lead to um, visual impairment or other gen genetics. So, 
Um, there's a large variety of visual impairments that, that we need to be looking at. And if you're wondering what CVI is, it's, and I know a lot of you are familiar with the term, but, and there's some disagreement, is it cortical, is it cerebral, is it neurological, do we call it, we just call it the CVIs now, most of us, are, it's, it's very difficult to, to totally separate that. Yeah, there is some pure cortical visual impairment, but in general, with the populations we're talking about, they're gonna have a combination of different parts of the brain that are affecting the use of vision or the, the vision itself. Homonymous hemianopia is by definition cerebral visual impairment. If any of you all need support for that, call me. I will write it down for your state. But we believe very strongly because the definition of cerebral or neurologically um, or brain-based visual impairment is it's not explained by an ocular condition. So... I know there are some states where kids are having difficulty getting vision services, and if you have a problem, email me, Terry, Monica, and we will try and help you through that. <clears throat> the other thing we might have to understand is there may have been CVI before the surgical procedure, and also that post-surgical complications like infection, hydrocephalus, um, these, these may all also further interfere with the use of vision or actually damage the visual pathways. So how do we measure all of this? You know, what do you need to be looking for? First of all, the child needs a comprehensive eye exam, medical exam, by somebody who knows what to look for. Then they need a functional visual evaluation. That's where a lot of times you miss out, unfortunately, with the eye care professional, like the ophthalmologist or the optometrist, because we're really good at looking at, fun at, at vision and the anatomy and the prescription, but not as good at, at looking at the function. So sometimes you have to seek out and involve your uh, teacher of the visually impaired also and orientation mobility instructors who are very important in this. As ophthalmologists, we can try and piece together the, the neurological, medical, and functional example. If I know what kind of procedure your child had, I might be able to predict where we might look for the visual field loss. So we know to look for it, okay? Um, MRIs are helpful. Visual field testing in children is very, very difficult. We have some gross visual field tests we can do, but it's very difficult. So, you know, some of you want to know more specific about the visual field loss, and it's not always easy for us to say. We can maybe predict from scans, from the surgery, from past history, from function, but to be exact, oh, it's exactly 20 degrees or it's exactly 40 degrees. As a child's older and can do the test, it may be a little bit easier, but it's not, it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy for an adult, believe me, because I take care of adults too, and, and you should go do a visual field self on yourself. You know, you sit there and you're like, oh, I'm so bored. Oh, when is this going to be over? You know, mine are never accurate. Um, so OCT is an, in, I want to show, now talk about a few new things. And OCT is one of them, optical coherent tomography. You all may, if you went in for an eye exam, you may have had one done where they say, oh, I'm going to take a little picture of the back of your eye. Um, it's all about the retinotopic organization that goes from that retina, that retina ganglion cell that I can look in. I can't see the cell, but I know where it is. But the OCT can take a picture of it, is directly synapsed into the brain. Okay, very, very interesting that then when something happens in the brain, we can pick it up on the map of this retina. It's a very inexpensive test. You have to be able to sit there and, and look for about seven seconds. I'm doing it on all my kids. The first norms for kids, the first book came out out of Duke last week. So we're now going to see an explosion in this technology. Um, it, you'll, you'll be hearing it more and more. So I'm just going to show you a little bit about it. You know, here's the normal anatomy here of the retina. So I can look inside of the eye here and look at the back of the eye, which is where the retina ganglion cells are, and then they go down, dive into the optic nerve here that's going to go back here, cross in the chiasm, lateral geniculate body, and go, and there'll be synapses in the cortical area. So OCT then captures the microscopic detail of the optic nerve and retina and assesses information of structures derived from the diencephalon. And this is what a picture looks like. That's your fovea in the back of the eye. There's the nerve. There's your retina. And this is what the machine looks like. There's technical challenges in kids, but now we actually have handheld 
OCTs for kids. Okay, so this is technology you're going to see a lot of. Um, <clears throat> in one of the epilepsy groups, there was a study of 250 persons, 65% who could not do the regular visual field testing could do OCT. Okay, so good question leads to my next. Oops, here's, here's actually a picture of, did I go back? Hold on. Of a young man who had a craniopharyngioma, midline brain tumor, resected. He's doing great. He's like 14 years out. And this is his OCT. Here's his visual field showing bitemporal hemianopia. Here's the picture of the macula. This is like a heat. This is, you know, a heat map. This is the right eye. This is the left eye. And it shows this is normal out temporally because it'll be the nasal field, nasal um, ganglion cells that'll be involved. So they're gone. They're gone. And you can see it on, on his other studies. I just think this is fascinating. I'd like to you know, go more in it, but we have a limited amount of time. And this is another way... Um, this, this is actually a man who has a homonymous hemianopia, who's an adult, and we can pick it up right here. Those fibers are gone. <laughs> Ocular coherent tomography, sometimes it's also called optical coherent tomography. Some of your pediatric ophthalmologists may have that in their office now. It's just new, it's new technology. So a lot of us didn't have it. Well, I've had one for a long time because I do adults, but they didn't have it because there weren't norms for kids. So it was a research tool, but now it'll become a clinical tool. And this is another thing we're starting to look at at my school for the blind, and it's eye tracking technology. This is, a, uh, this is just in my office. The thing that changed is now the Toby has a $150 plug-in into your computer with free software. And so I was able to get all this for free instead of $28,000, which your no normal Tobies would be. So actually a private practice doctor could afford it. This is in my office. And um, this is, a, of course, the technical person because I don't know what I'm doing. Um, this was a girl who was new to me. She had a history of cystic encephalopathy. She was living with her grandma, no other history. She's amblyopic in one eye, so she's only seeing out of one eye. And this is the heat map of where she could see. She saw nothing on the other side. We don't know. This is just simple, new technology. Marlene will probably talk about it a little more. But there's some new stuff coming out. What we want to try and understand is how does your child see? That's the main thing. How do they see? so that we can better help them through the learning process, the habilitation, rehabilitation. So Terry's going to take it from here. We're trying to leave plenty of time for questions, too. You can keep talking while I pull this up if you want. So you'll tell me if this is OK. Is that good? Um, so I'm Terry Schwartz. I'm a pediatric ophthalmologist. I work at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. I see patients in clinic. I do surgeries. I'm a, just a typical pediatric ophthalmologist. The only thing unusual about me is that uh, very early in my career, I developed an interest in what happened to kids that walked outside of my clinic that had vision impairment. What were we doing with them? So for 20 years, I've had a low vision rehabilitation program in first in West Virginia. Actually, that one's still going. We have a new one in Cincinnati. Um, and uh, afterwards, I became interested in, in less ocular visual impairment, but more brain-based visual impairment, and got very involved with our community of kids with cerebral visual impairment. And I will say, I will echo Linda's words, this is still very new for me, even though I see these kids all the time. We really haven't been asking very many questions about your kids. So Linda's already nicely co covered this. We know that seizures have an effect on visual function, right? Conditions that cause seizures affect vision globally, especially how we process what we see. We know that there's an effect of all the medications we use to treat seizures, and many of your kids are still on medications even after surgery. Uh, and we know that seizures themselves, of course, can cause problems with visual attention that I'll mention in just a minute. And then finally, the big topic that we're all here about is what about the surgery to control seizures? 
So just a note about visual attention. Our visual attention allows us to explore objects in our visual environment. It lets us learn. Some people suggest that perhaps 80% of learning is involved with vision. So when does visual attention become important? Well, really early on. So at about eight to 10 weeks, we have this phase of alertness. And by six months, two really important things happen. One, we see that babies have an increased ability to sustain attention, and we have to sustain attention to be able to learn and acquire information about an object, but also the ability to, to disengage our attention, to look elsewhere, to get other clues from our visual environment. So this is an important uh, reason to control seizures. So hemispherectomy, of course, I'm not gonna talk about the anatomy of this, but we know that it's disconnection in some cases, especially in uh, you know, older literature, the removal of entire hemisphere of the brain. The great news about it, we heard yesterday, 73% of kids achieve long-term freedom from seizures, that's great. As I said, the technique is evolving, but we know that it's definitely associated with long-term changes in visual function and cognition. So what are the possible effects of hemispherectomy on visual function? Well, field of vision, we've heard that over and over, homonymous hemianopia. It, we haven't really talked about this, but it's becoming clear that it also affects visual acuity, which we'll talk about in a second. Our, the alignment of the eyes, how the eyes work together, our ability to see in depth, or what, what has been called 3D vision or stereopsis, visual neglect, and also reading and literacy. So the visual field is rather interesting. It's not full size early on if it's tested behaviorally in the first month of life, and that's what you see on your left-hand side as a baby that we stole out of the nursery. Um, and you see with this little test, it's called kinetic, perimeter, kinetic perimetry. Basically, we're looking at the child's eye movements to inform us when they can see an object that's being presented uh, to the right, left, up, or down. There's a slightly older child that you can see on the opposite side of the screen. It becomes adult-like by about a year of age. And in some types of brain injury, we do actually see plasticity or reorganization, not necessarily as Dr. Bierman's gonna talk to us about after, surger, after a particular surgery, but for example, in hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Um, so what is this homonymous hemianopia? Basically, it means that in each eye, we've lost part of the visual field. How much of the visual field is lost depends in part on where the injury is, and I'm gonna show you a cartoon of that in just a moment. But let's imagine what are the functional consequences of losing part of your field of vision in both eyes. Well, the obvious one is being able to travel safely, to walk safely, and that is especially true when you're walking through a crowded space, a new environment, if your child is considering or hoping to drive, for example. So uh, this cartoon, you can just, I'm gonna get in trouble if I walk away here. Uh, can you see this cursor? Yeah. Okay, super. So the, this cartoon shows you the eyes, uh, and again, what Linda showed us here, the optic nerve and the connections to the way back of the brain. And what you can see is depending on where the lesion is located, so if it's very anterior, it can affect an entire visual field, for example, in one eye only, on the same side of the lesion. Oh, I just lost my, hang on. Uh, and uh, the further back we go, we see defects that are more similar in each eye, uh, and in fact, more complete. Interestingly, there was a recent uh, study that showed that the field is slightly better preserved or a little asymmetric uh, on, in the eye that's on the same side of the surgery. So we know now that there are actually some compensatory strategies that our kids use, not consciously, but use to expand the functional size of the visual field. In this picture, I'm showing you a child with exotropia, which means an outward turning of the eyes, and I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of you have noticed this in your kids. This uh, actually is probably the most common kind of strabismus, which means eye misalignment that I, just, that I see in my general practice. 
Um, but interestingly, it is way more common in our kids who've had hemispherectomy or a epilepsy surgery procedure than in the general population. In one study, almost 40% of kids demonstrated a constant or intermittent exotropia to the opposite side of the hemispherectomy. That means if the surgery was done on the right, the eye, of course, we've lost our field to the left, and the left eye drifts out. Um, we also saw in another study that kids are five times more likely for the eye that drifts to point to the blind or the non-seeing side, all of which suggests that this is a true compensatory adaptation. This isn't just happenstance. Um, what else do we see in our kids? We see also a compensatory turn, in uh, face turn toward the field, sorry, I'm getting out of my microphone, out of the, in, toward the field, uh, or toward the blind side. Um, and what does this do for a child? It centers their remaining field. We think maybe it increases the efficiency of scanning, and we see it in over half the kids after surgery who have a homonymous hemianopia. Um, so this question has been raised, and I really want to address it. It's something I'm learning about. I had to learn about it because a parent came in to me with this photo of a turkey and said that their child had had a hemispherectomy to control seizures, and he could not complete half of his work ever. Um, and she was confused. She didn't know what to do about it. So let's look at hemianopia versus visual neglect. So here I'm demonstrating, and thank you Gordon Dutton, he is the, the uh, father of us all uh, in terms of brain-based visual impairment. And what you see here, I'm gonna move my little cursor around. So here's a child with her head forward, and she's got a left-sided field defect, and what you can see is there's no way for her to see this little white dot to her left. But look what happens when she turns her head to the left. Now, this is within her field of view. Well, what happens if she leaves her head straight but turns her body, and that's what's happening in this picture? Nothing. She can't really acquire a picture of that little white dot. And so, um, hemianopia is head-centric or capitocentric. That is, it moves with the eyes and the head. It's mapped in the occipital lobes. So, as I said, the head turn finds the disc, but the body turn doesn't find the disc, as opposed to neglect. And so here we have this child who has visual neglect. Uh, again, with her head and body straight, there's no view of the white dot. With a, a head turn, simply a head turn, there's no view of the white dot or no appreciation of it. And with a body turn, all of a sudden, the white dot is within the field of view. So neglect is different. It's an inability to process or to perceive stimuli, and not just visual stimuli, on one side of the body or the entire environment on that side. Um, it's, we think of it as body-centric or corporocentric, that is, it moves with the body. So often a body turn will provide that field that's missing. Um, it, it seems to be centered in the parietal lobe, um, which map the world with respect to the body. Why do we have it? It helps us to move through space, um, independent of where our heads are, where our eyes are. We all know that we can move through space without looking where we're going often. Um, so why is this important? Let's think about it functionally in a classroom. You've got your child pressed up against the desk. They're trying to look at something, they can turn their head, but if they have neglect and they, there's no ability to turn the body, they're gonna miss what's going on on the other side. So I'll raise one other question. Does this happen in children? And so there is some literature that suggests that it might happen, but it's transient, that is, it goes away. Um, and I would put to you that we probably don't know because I don't think we ask the question enough. Uh, I certainly know that I don't. I'll be interested to see, or if, see if Dr. Berman has anything else to say about it. Um, can it recover? Uh, I, if anybody's interested in a very interesting story about neglect, Lisa Genova, who wrote Still Alice, many of you know the movie about early uh, onset dementia, 
uh, has also written a book called Left Neglected about an adult who had a and car at, was in a motor vehicle accident and describes this phenomena beautifully. So let's talk a little bit about reading and literacy. What's the effect on a hemianopic defect? And if anybody has listened to any of to the people who have talked about language, obviously we know that reading is so strongly a language function. But I want to talk just just a minute about like what I'm calling the me mechanical issues with a missing, missing field. So if we've got a right-sided defect and we're trying to follow a line of print to the right, you can imagine that we're gonna need some kind of adaptive behavior to help with that. Maybe a line, a line isolator. And the same thing is true with the left-sided defect. Finishing a line and getting back to the next line becomes problematic without some kind of guide. So I, I call that a mechanical issue. There's also literature about what's been called a hemianopic dyslexia, and I'm not talking about language, the, the stuff that is all about language. And that is with a central or near central defect, some kids develop severe reading difficulty that has nothing to do with language processing. Um, and it's thought that it has something to do with the control of visual spatial attention. That is how we guide our eyes, the scan path of our eyes, uh, when reading text. Um, Linda also talked about optic nerve injury, ganglion cell injury that we're now picking up with OCT. So there are a couple of reasons not to to have optic nerve damage, and the first is that many of our many of your kids develop post surgical hydrocephalus. Sometimes it is unrecognized, and unrecognized persistent high pressures can cause damage to the optic nerve. The second is from a retrograde or backwards degeneration of the nerve that occurs after surgery. So. What does damage to the optic nerve do? So these are kind of these are called lower level visual functions, if you will. Decreased visual acuity. Again, visual acuity is worse in the eye opposite the side of surgery. Uh, decreased contrast sensitivity and sometimes impaired color perception. And I'm just going to talk about these very briefly. What's visual acuity? Visual acuity is our ability to see small bits or small objects at very high contrast. It develops, so at, if you measure it behaviorally in the first year of life, vision is about 2,400 to 2,600, and it improves very rapidly over the first year of life, but doesn't usually hit 2020 until we're between two and five years of age. How do we test it? Well, in nonverbal kids, we use a test that involves grading, uh, which is a resolution acuity. It's not the same as reading the eye chart, but sometimes it's all we have to assess visual uh, to assess visual acuity in kids, and as they get older, we use what are called optotype acuities. That is um, actual figures. These are Lea symbols, but also, of course, letters and numbers. I want to talk about contrast because we don't think about it very often, and it's the ability to distinguish something from the background. And so, the best way to de really describe it is to show you one of the tests that we use for it. Over here is a Pelly chart. And what you see is letters of the same size, but decreasing contrast from the background. So contrast is kind of interesting. It, uh, so the smallest thing you can see at the highest contrast, that's over here, that's visual acuity. That's what we record as visual acuity. The bigger something is and the smaller something is, the more contrast you need to be able to see it. And so when things are kind of medium size, you actually can see them quite well at low contrast. So why do we care about contrast? Well, it's really important for safe travel, for being able to see print when it's very impaired, being able to read is impossible, and also critically social interaction. So here's a picture of one of my technicians obviously sneering on the left, and as I decrease her contrast, but I don't defocus the picture, she could be smiling. It's a little hard to tell, isn't it? That's a big difference. Um, this is just an example of a child at four months of age already imitating a mom's facial expression. And if you can't discern that facial expression, how much you lose 
as because it's a learned behavior, social interaction. Interestingly, one of the tests that we use to test contrast in kids that are pre-verbal is based on faces. Thank you, Leah Havarnan. And you can see faces of decreasing contrast. Um, next to last, I just want to talk about this recent report of visual hallucinations in kids, um, one of them in the first month after surgery, the other one about a year and a half after surgery, uh, kids who had had hemispherectomies. Uh, fortunately, in this paper, the hallucinations were transient, and I want to tell you what they look like. So they're visual hallucinations. These kids describe them as scary or frightening, but we've seen these hallucinations in sudden vision loss in adults, and actually in children. I have several kids that I've taken care of where they'll see things as, as benign. One of, one of my kids saw just a ballerina sitting in the corner of their room. Maybe that's frightening, I don't know. Um, but So it's well described in vision loss. Is this happening in our kids post-hemispherectomy? I don't know. I think it's a question we haven't really asked. Um, and so again, a, perhaps a research question that we need to think about. Finally, I want to talk about something that's a bit controversial, and that is persistent vision in this absent or blind visual field. We know that in, in kids, and this has been described after hemispherectomy, that there is some ability to respond in the blind visual field. And the description of this is mostly uh, something that's moving. And that's because there's an area of the brain that doesn't quite make it all the way to the back of the brain. It's below consciousness that subserves um, uh, the ability to recognize movement. And um, so we don't know exactly much about this. We don't know how much we would see this in our kids with hemispherectomy. Uh, I know that Dr. Bierman is now going to talk to us about how does the brain recover function after epilepsy surgery. We don't think that it's a reorganization within the uh, damaged field, but it may be an area that's subserved by a different part of the visual system that's a very, very old part of the visual system. It's across all animals, all creatures. So that's all I have to say. Thanks for your attention. Okay. Um, my name is Marlene Berman. I'm a vision neuroscientist from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Um, I actually worked as a clinician, as a speech pathologist, for five years with kids who had had uh, hemispherectomy and um, thought that I might be able to intervene better if I went back to try and understand how the brain works to the best of our knowledge. And uh, so I am now no longer a clinician but have a very serious commitment to working with kids with hemispherectomy. Um, my talk today is going to be about the visual brain and visual behavior following a resection. But before I go any further, I really need to offer a thousand thanks to all of you. Uh, we've been running uh, studies on the 16th floor yesterday, today, and sometime tomorrow. And I think that this will give us the largest collection of data that exists anyway just from having these 32 kids participate in our study is going to give us insights that we have not been able to acquire thus far. So a thousand thanks to the families. I will quickly cut to my conclusion, just in case you, this is all you want to know. So I think it's early days still in trying to understand what these kids can see and can't see and why they can and can't see things. I'm going to tell you some less good news, and that's mostly going to be that if they've got a visual field defect, it's really unlikely that it's going to recover. But then I'm going to tell you some more good news, and that is that the remaining hemisphere appears to have potential that we were not sure existed. And so there are opportunities for reorganization, and I'll show you some examples. And there are opportunities over the course of development for the single hemisphere to be able to change in its functionality. But there is so much that we have to learn. There, we know more than we did 10 years ago, and I hope that we will know a whole lot more in 10 years. But there are you know, so many open questions, and I'm just sorry that I don't have more information for you. 
So just to give you a little example, so um, I typically see kids like this. They've either had a single lobe um, resected, usually multiple lobes. We only have a small set of children who've had full hemispherectomies, um, except after being at this conference where we've got behavior from a lot of kids with hemispherectomies. So all of these kids have had a resection that affects the occipital and or the temporal lobes, the two main lobes involved in vision. And we always compare both the brain profile as well as the behavior of these kids to kids who've had resections but in, say, frontal cortex, where there is no visual involvement whatsoever. And of course, we compare them to control individuals who are matched in various ways. So let me start off by telling you what the problem is that the brain has to solve in the visual system. So this is a picture from the Cincinnati Zoo, in case anybody wanted to go. And the challenge for the brain is to be able to interpret, to make sense of the signal that comes from the eye. So this is what the eye picks up. If you look out at the environment, the only thing that the eyes can, the signal that the eye takes from the environment is how much light there is, like there's more light here on the ceiling than maybe there is here on the floor, so how much intensity of light there is, and something about the quality of the light, is it a bit more reddish or a bit more bluish, that's it. That's what your eye picks up from the environment. To make meaning of what you're seeing is the job of the brain. The brain computes. The brain derives coherence from these very sparse signals that come from the eye. If the eye is not sending information to the brain, of course, the brain can't do anything about it. But in cases where the eyes are sending the signal, the job of the brain is to actually do the computation that permits us a visual understanding. OK, I'm going to show you just you know, two minutes of uh, the visual system of the brain. So we've already heard uh, very graciously from my colleagues that the eye signals go from the eye all the way along these pathways, and then the signals enter the brain at the occipital lobe way here at the back. It's a really long distance that these signals have to travel. Sometimes I wonder why the visual system isn't right behind the eyeballs, but that's a question for another day. Um, OK, so the signals enter uh, into the brain. And these areas right here at the very back of the brain are referred to as early visual cortex. They begin to kind of grind the signal that's coming from the eye. And they sort of cut and dice and analyze the signal. And then they send it forward to the temporal lobe and also up to the parietal lobe. So. Shown here on the right-hand side are all the areas of the brain that are involved in vision. About one-third of the entire brain is concerned with deriving meaning from visual signals. That is a lot of the brain. It also means that if you have a surgical resection in very different parts, you could have a visual defect. So uh, vision or visual meaning, visual cognition, is affected by posterior resections to the occipital lobe, of course. It's also affected by TPO resections, where the temporal and the parietal lobes are removed, because, of course, they also participate in vision. And if your child has a hemispherectomy, for sure there is going to be some kind of uh, visual impairment. Um, my real interest here is in trying to understand the functional outcomes, both the behavioral outcomes, as well as what is going on in the brain in these children who've had these kinds of resections. So just to give you an example, if you have a posterior resection, it's going to affect this part of the brain. If you have a TPO resection, it's going to affect this part of the brain. And of course, if you have a hemispherectomy, you affect all parts of the visual system on that side. And so the question is, what is the impact of these kinds of resections, both on behavior and neurally? And so I'll divide my talk into two sections. Firstly, I'll talk about what happens if you have 
uh, a resection to the early part of the visual system, the occipital lobe. And then we can talk about what happens when the occipital lobe is preserved, but the resection is somewhat more anterior. So this is in the temporal lobe itself. One of the ways in which we do this is these days we take participants, kids, adults, they lie in a standard MRI machine. I'm sure your kids have been in this many times before. But now we can present images onto a screen that's uh, in the center of the ball. And onto the screen, we can show them, for example, faces or objects or houses. And we can see which parts of the brain are activated, which are being driven by these particular visual stimuli. So I'm going to tell you about behavior, and I'm going to tell you about the neural basis of this behavior. So we have these two different systems. I'm going to start telling you a little bit about if the resection includes occipital cortex. So we've already heard a lot that if you have a resection that affects occipital cortex, there will be blindness on the side of space opposite to that hemisphere. This is the homonymous hemianopia that we've known about. Following a right occipital resection, you're going to have blindness on the left-hand side and vice versa if the resection is on the right-hand side. You probably all know that your kids have this kind of perimetry. We've already heard some discussion about it. Little dots come up on a screen. A kid says whether they see it or not. If they see all the dots, they have full visual fields. Most often, these kids are hemianopic, i.e. they don't detect any of the dots on the side of the opposite to the resection. This is the homonymous hemianopia. And we can look at what happens in their brains. So we can show them images like this when they lie in the bore of the MRI magnet. And we can see that information on the left drives the right hemisphere, and information on the right drives activation in the left hemisphere. So now let me show you kids with hemi and, well, first, this is a kid um, who has a resection, but it's way anterior. So the occipital lobes are absolutely fine. And in fact, this child has full visual fields, has no blindness whatsoever. And then we look at the brain. This is the area of the brain that's been removed. But both occipital lobes can be driven by visual stimuli. This is kind of what you would see in a typical individual's occipital cortex. So now we have a kid who has an occipital and temporal lobectomy. And uh, this kid has got a homonymous hemianopia, as you see over here. And we see, this is the, brain, the side of the brain that's been removed. This big chunk has been removed here. Only one side, only one hemisphere responds visually. So if you have a resection on the right-hand side, only the left hemisphere is going to respond to visual stimulation. We have not seen any recovery of the homonymous hemianopia, of the field defect in any of the kids that we've studied. But I've only seen something like 30 or 40 kids. And we wrote a review paper about uh, the absence of a uh, change in visual field status in these kids post-resection. And this lists all of the details of all the kids that we've seen, and it is in this paper, and I'm happy to give it to Monica to load, and you all are welcome to take a look at it. Um, but of course, we haven't seen all the kids. Uh, maybe there are kids who recover. We just haven't seen them. So we also did an enormous literature search to examine all of the possible reported cases. And there are, in fact, four patients out of maybe several hundred who show recovered visual field. And of those who recover from the hemianopia, the kids are all somewhat atypical, unusual. So one of them, for example, is this kid who was only born with a left hemisphere. So kind of like the whole brain was present just in one hemisphere. And so this kid did not have homonymous hemianopia. A single hemisphere was able to see in both visual fields. Just very, very unusual. Here are uh, uh, three of the other cases. Some have had surgery, some have not had surgery, some were early, some were late. It's all very complicated, and it seems rather atypical to me. So um, I think that 
we would be best served by reaching the conclusions that there is no obvious reorganization of early visual cortex of the occipital lobe. We don't see activation in the single remaining hemisphere in response to stimulation on both sides. It only seems to respond to the visual field opposite that hemisphere. And mostly we see persistent and stable hemianopia. So that's the less good news. So let's move on to the uh, somewhat, uh, go ahead, please. Yeah. Um, it could be. Now, strokes can occur pretty much anywhere in the brain. So, but if the stroke were in occipital cortex, there is a kind of um, uh, vascular tear that supports just the posterior part, the posterior cerebral artery. So if you have a stroke of the posterior cerebral, I guess Americans say cerebral artery, then um, you would see something very similar to this. Yeah. Okay. So higher order visual cortex, so mostly temporal cortex. Um, we evaluate how well temporal cortex is working by asking kids to tell us whether they can see forms. So what I mean by form here is, can they tell us that this is pointing more leftwards and this is pointing more rightwards? Here is another one. This is one of these images has got more coherent swirl in it. You have to be able to pick up all the little dots to see that they're all making a coherent pattern. Can kids do this? If you have damage to temporal lobe, that's often very difficult. We also test them on face recognition tests for kids and on various object recognition tests. And I want you to show you just a little bit of data that we have managed to accumulate so far. So here are the findings from uh, these kids on the form perception. Only two kids, this one in with red and this one with red here, are impaired. Most of our kids are able to perceive forms. One hemisphere is enough to perceive forms. One hemisphere is also enough to recognize faces and objects. And again, it's just these two kids who are having difficulty. These two kids are also atypical in particular ways. One of them has got polymicrogyria. It means that the brain has developed in a very unusual way. And the other kid has got very low IQ. But setting those two things aside, we were encouraged to discover that kids can actually perceive some complexity with a single hemisphere. So what does the brain look like in these kids? So again, we're going to have them lying in the magnet. Oh, and I should tell you, if anybody wants to bring their child to Pittsburgh to participate in these MRI studies, um, my email address is again at the end of my presentation, and I'd be very happy to talk to you about it. Uh, the more information we can get, the better things are going to be. Okay, so this is what happens. This is the base of the brain. So like if I took a wire cutter and I cut off my head and I flipped it over, <laughs> you're going to be looking down on the base of my brain. So we put kids in the magnet and we show them faces and houses and objects and some scrambling and some words, and we see a very typical map of regions that respond to these kinds of stimuli. This is early visual cortex that we've already spoken about. These blue areas on, in the brain respond when kids see objects. The red areas, m stronger in the right hemisphere than the left hemisphere, respond to faces. The blue area over here responds to words, and that's in the left hemisphere. And you can see these green areas in both hemispheres that respond to kind of big scenes or navigation landscapes. So we call these the regions of interest. I'm going to call it ROI from now on. And this is just a kind of a cheat sheet for where these regions of interest should be. Think of it as kind of a map of the regions of the brain that show strong responses to particular kinds of stimuli. So what happens if you only have one hemisphere when we know that face recognition is mostly done by the right hemisphere and word recognition is mostly done by the left hemisphere, but you've only got one hemisphere? So I'm going to show you data from a bunch of kids. This is a, uh, the kid who had the more anterior resection. It does not actually affect temporal 
uh, parts of the temporal lobe that we're interested in. And in fact, this kid has got all of the regions of interest. So that's a pretty um, sort of standard finding if the resection is kind of super anterior in the temporal lobe. Okay, and here are other kids with different kinds of resections. You can see this resection here. It's hard for me to see what's up there. I think this kid only ever has responses. And again, these responses correspond to the regions that we're interested in. So these, uh, you can see that the, some kids only have, oh yeah, okay. This is a kid, this is a, a left hemisphere, down the column here is left hemisphere resections. These are right hemisphere resections. And they have some regions, but they don't have all of the regions. When we are able to detect the presence of these regions, even in just one hemisphere, we see the following. We see that, what? You're kidding. Um, sorry. Was, everything was going along swimmingly. I'm actually going to just have to reboot this. I'm really sorry. I'll just restart it. This has never happened. Um, it's sort of at moments like this where you can see how well your dramatic abilities <laughs> <laughs> come into effect. Um, there actually is a new kind of competition for PhD students, and that is that you have to dance the results of your PhD. <laughs> so uh, if I had any dancing abilities, I would be trying to dance the results of hemispherectomy on the visual system. It actually is not even restarting. Wow, this is like a cliffhanger. Oh. Okay, sorry, it's starting up again. It'll just be another moment or two. I'll take a question if you have one. Go ahead. So he was, I, I missed the first part. He's, when was his surgery? Oh, at 11, and he was previously left-handed. He, he yeah. was left-handed. Yeah, got and it. And he had a right hemisphere. Yeah, got it. Um, so we know that there are 10% of the population only, oh, sorry, yes, 10% of the population is left-handed. So that's unusual to start off with. So pretty much everything that I'm telling you here is about um, kids who are right-handed. Okay, and we know that in the typical right-hander, these are the regions of interest. This is what the brain map should look like. Okay, sorry. I'm at 20 minutes, so I'm just going to... Oh, okay. All right. I th hope we're back in business here. I don't know what caused that, and I hope it doesn't happen again. But here we... I will just pick up right where I left off. Okay. So, okay. So, if we can define these regions of interest, even just in a single hemisphere, the existing regions look normal, with very few exceptions. So, a single hemisphere that has a selective regions that responds to faces, that responds to objects. Those regions look normal. And that's awesome, because it means that the existing part of the brain is able to carry out the function that would have been carried out by the two hemispheres. Sometimes you don't have all of the regions because they've been resected. But if they exist, things are pretty good. 
the, I'm going to take just two more minutes to show you two other aspects of the results. So I told you that face recognition is mostly done by the right hemisphere and word recognition is mostly done by the left hemisphere. And what if you've had a left hemispherectomy? What happens to word recognition? How is the child going to be able to learn to read? And so I'm going to show you just a few bits of findings. There was a case published in 2004 with a child who had a left uh, occipital temporal resection. And this child, so here control children. This is the activation that you see in the left hemisphere of the visual word form area. This is the area of the brain that's going to go on to do the reading. So typically in controls, it's in the left hemisphere. And in this individual, it turned up in the right hemisphere. So this is one of the few times where you actually see like a major shift of function from the one side to the other. And for a long time, people were very puzzled by this kind of perplexing result. So we now have seen two additional kids in whom the left hemisphere was removed, and you can see the emergence of the visual word form area in the right hemisphere. So here is a kid where you can see it emerging in the right hemisphere where everybody else, if they've got a blue dot, that's the visual word form area in the left hemisphere. This kid has got it in the right hemisphere. And we have recently, just this, a few days ago, seen this kid, which is why we've just got all of the images from the brain scan. This kid, too, is showing the visual word form area in the left hemisphere. So we now have seen it more than once. And uh, now there are three such cases. And I think this is reason for cautious optimism uh, in kids who've been hemispherectomized on the left. The last very small point that I'll make, and I actually won't even go through all of the slides, is simply to tell you that we observe changes in the visual system of the brain for many years post-surgery. So it does not necessarily remain absolutely stable, whatever the deficit was immediately after the surgery, setting aside the hemianopia. But if the kid had not yet learned to read, we can see emergence in the right hemisphere. Even in kids uh, who've had different kinds of resections, given enough time, we see uh, a longer developmental trajectory and changes in the brain over this uh, longer period of time. And I'm happy to put uh, these published papers uh, onto the website, and you're all completely welcome to look at them and send me email. So I think there is cautious optimism here, and that is that uh, if the resection is not in occipital cortex, but to temporal or parietal cortex, we can often still see normal behavior, with few exceptions. I, I will always say with some exceptions. The way the brain responds is normal. The extent of the activation is normal. The signal in that area seems to be normal. And we also see emergence over time in the other hemisphere, and also even in a single hemisphere, it can continue to develop. So I'll just wrap back to my conclusions. There's some less good news. The visual field doesn't seem to recover as much as we would like. There's some more good news. If occipital cortex is spared, we're actually seeing reasonably good uh, neural profiles and behavior in the kids. We, it depends on the age, the surgery, et cetera, all the variables that you know about. And um, it is really my hope that um, even with the data that we've collected in these 32 children at this conference, we'll be able to say something more sensible and meaningful. So I, um, my funding is from the National Institutes of Health. This is my email. You're welcome to contact me. These are all the people who work with me. And I'm very grateful to the families again. And sorry for running over. So I'm going to say thank you. And there was a little confusion about the time because we actually do have another session in this room at 3.15, which is in six minutes. So I'm going to allow oh. each presenter to answer one question. And you get to go first. <laughs> um, it indicated uh, on the notes that the strabismus surgery was controversial, and I was wondering if you could tell me why. Is only that if the child has assumed this position to functionally increase their visual field, when you perform surgery to correct the eye position, you are functionally decreasing their visual field. 
I didn't hear it. Um, So my daughter has glasses right now, but she's actually extra focused. Right, so it does the same thing. Glasses glasses are another means of correcting the exotropia, but it still functionally is doing the same thing. If the exotropia is there as an adaptive mechanism to increase the field of vision, then as you correct, as you straighten the eyes, again, you've decreased the field. But on the other hand, there is, there is a, you know, a lot of our kids are using eye gaze technology for communication. It's very confusing for an eye tracker when eyes are not pointing in the same direction. So that's a problem. And number two, it is, we do know from psychological studies, it is off-putting when someone's eye is not pointing, when they're not pointing in the same direction. I, I hate to say cosmetically, but Basically, if someone doesn't know where they're looking, it becomes the teacher. We get a lot of complaints. Teachers, I don't think he's paying attention because I can't tell where he's looking, right? We hear that all the time. Uh, The other thing, there was a a psychological study. This now is probably 20 years old where they altered the photos of of, of typically typical college students, making them look turned out or turned in. And the kids who have turned out eyes are often thought of as not trustworthy. So, uh, right, uh, people, that's what, you know, we all jump to conclusions wrongly most of the time about what we see, but so there are reasons to fix it. I'm just saying the controversy lies in, you know, what's going to be the result of making those eyes straight. And I do it all the time, but I'm just saying we need to think about it. Jill's in the back, our next presenter. We're going a little over. Do you mind if we take one more question? Okay. Okay. So I saw a hand here. So, and I'm sorry, I, are the presenters going to be outside in the lobby willing to take some questions? We'll take one more on mic and the rest in the lobby. Thank you. Um, uh, my question is for uh, you, who, Dr. Berman. Thank you. Um, my granddaughter had a, resection, uh, a total removal of the left side um, on June 3rd. The doctors to whom we've been speaking have said the arm, which isn't working. And of course she's six and starting the reading process. Uh, My first question is, we're talking about the left side, the the information that I have believe I have received from the doctors are, well, that information should have transferred to the right. Now, I don't know what that means in total definition of each of those words, but that's what I heard. Yes, yeah, so um, I, let, let me say that we sometimes already see the sort of change and the shift in the hemispheric functions prior to the surgery. So if the left hemisphere is not really functional tissue, then the fun- like the visual word form area, will already be migrating into the right hemisphere even before surgery happens. So surgery is not like the definitive date because these kids have been having seizures all along. The oh, tissue yes. is already right. dysfunctional. Correct. And so pre-surgically, there already may have been some of the migration. All right, my heart has been now steadied. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, sorry. I'm really sorry, guys. Thank you.